Good morning. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your many mercies. Thank you that we are blessed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, your gifts are limitless in him. And you give and give and give. Thank you for that. Help us to rejoice in that. Help us to trust that, to rely on that, to rest in that. Your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Matthew chapter 4 tells us, Then when was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Very interesting. You know that when Jesus cast out the demons from the men at uh, the garrisons there. In fact, I just recently noticed in one of the gospels it says there was two men. I always thought of one, but there was two and they were fierce and nobody could go by there. And when Jesus cast the demon out of them, the demon said, we know who thou art, Jesus, the son of God. The demons knew who Jesus was, the Son of God. Yet, the religious, religious rulers and leaders of the day did not know who Jesus was. The devils knew who he was. The religious leaders crucified him because he claimed he was the son of God and they did not believe that. The devils knew and Satan knew and when Jesus said, get hence, Satan left because Jesus had authority over Satan and has authority over the demons. If your observation of what's going on in this world is limited to your observation and your experience, you have a very limited perspective. Because we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principal, principalities and high places and evil spirits. And it's interesting here when Jesus said, uh, 
to, G, to when Satan said to Jesus, uh, behold all these kingdoms and showed him the kingdoms and the glory and said, I will give it to you. Jesus didn't refute that statement because right in the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, God told us that he would sow enmity between the seed of the woman, who is Jesus Christ, and the seed of Satan. There would be enmity there. So what did that mean? Warfare. That day the warfare began. Or at least for the kingdom of earth here maybe began in heaven before that day because Satan was cast out of heaven. So the warfare maybe began before. But for the earth, it began that day when Adam and Eve sinned because God had given Adam and Eve authority over the earth. But Adam and Eve resigned that, gave up that authority because of disobedience to God, not obeying God, not wanting to trust God to provide all their needs, but they wanted to know good and evil so they could carry out their own program, providing for themselves. So I believe at that point, Satan truly became the prince of this world. He runs this world in outwardly in through those that are not believers. He doesn't reign over believers. There have always been be some believers. And uh, it makes me think, right, that warfare, right from the beginning, we, God gives us many examples. For, like Moses, Pharaoh wanted to kill all the little children because of a prophet that was to come. Moses escaped that death, but many Hebrew children died because of the warfare. Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. And then Jesus came. Jesus was persecuted and crucified by the unbelievers. Although it was our sins really that crucified him because Jesus laid down his life. Nobody took it from him. Satan did not conquer Jesus on the cross. The reverse happened. Jesus conquered Satan on the cross. Jesus went there as a lamb slain, meek and lowly, didn't say a word, was humble and meek and lowly, and yet came away victorious. He was the victor. Jesus was the victor. Life was, had victory over death. Satan is the father of death and darkness. Murder, sin, war, envy. God is a God of life, giving goodness, health, light, the opposite. God talks about this welfare in Ephesians chapter 6. God tells us we are to put on the armor of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Very important. Be strong 
in yourselves, in your congregation, in your fellow brothers and believers, in your government. No. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. God is the only faithful one. We sang about his faithfulness, his victory minus. We need to sing that song more frequently. He is faithful, and only he is faithful. We can have good intentions and plan to be faithful, but we fail. But God does not. He is faithful. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The whole armor of God. And I would say one of those armors is the word of God. Not mentioned here, but I believe it's assumed because it's the word of God that tells us as we read this and as, as Paul spoke this by the Holy Spirit, it was these words that he was using to instruct us what to do. That's the word of God. Man doesn't live by bread alone. He does live by bread, but he lives by the word of God, more importantly. In fact, when I read from Matthew 4 there about Jesus' temptation, it was interesting that Jesus had fasted for 40 days and nights. And it was at that point that then Satan tempted him. The devils, I believe, are smarter than us. They've lived longer unless we have the mind of Christ. I'll have to qualify it with that. If we had the mind of Christ, we're conquerors more than conquerors. But without the mind of Christ, the demons are smarter. Mankind didn't know Jesus was God, they did. The religious people of the day that were the rulers didn't know Jesus was God, but the devils did. The devils came to Jesus, Satan came to Jesus to tempt him after he had fasted 40 days, 40 nights, knowing his weakness. The devils know our weakness by observation. They know where our weaknesses are. They're able to tempt us right at the right time for us to fall. If it were according to our own strength, we fall. It's not a fair fight. Except, if we're born again, we have the mind of Christ. And if we have the mind of Christ, we have the word of God. For Jesus was the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us to make the Father known to us who is the giver of every blessing and continues to bless us through Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ that we're blessed. In him we are blessed. Our life is in him, in, hid in him. We are not our own. We have been purchased with a price, the price of the blood of the Son of God. We're not saved by our faith. <laughs> We're saved by Christ's blood. It's through our faith that we receive our salvation. But our salvation is provided by Jesus Christ himself. We receive it through faith. And that, I believe, is why God said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, I don't know if he could have found anything smaller. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, why would he use the smallest stinking thing? Because he knows us. And that mustard seed, if I have a big sturdy chair here, say, but I've rigged it so 
it looks just all powerful. And I say, sit down in it. With all the confidence in the world, you go plopping that thing and it collapses. How much did that faith you had in it help you? And then I got this rickety old thing that I've significantly firmed up and it's sturdy. And I said, hey, take a seat. And you tremblingly say, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't can I trust you? I don't know. I don't. So you sit in it and it withstands your moving around and everything you do. That's the faith of a mustard seed. What you had your faith in was what was important. Not your faith. Our faith in God is what's important. Not how much faith we have, it's the God we have it in. That's what's important. So, God is all faithful. We're in good shape. <laughs> we are in good shape. God is all faithful. As little as our faith might be, if we have faith. And that's a question we have to ask. Do I have faith? I say I do. But faith without works is dead, James claimed. And I believe it's from the perspective, if we do have faith, some faith, some works will become manifest in our life. There will be righteous, good works manifest in our life. Even if it's only, which is the most important thing actually, believing God. But if you believe God, you're going to follow him and he has given us his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit will produce fruit. We don't make the fruit. God makes the fruit. If fruit comes out in our life, it's his fruit, not our fruit. He's the vine, we're a branch. We're just hooked into the source of life. These words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, he has told us. He produces the fruit in us. It's not ours. But if we do have faith, we will grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and fruit will be produced in our life. If we see no fruit, we need to beseech God, be merciful. Oh God, have mercy on me. And God is a merciful God and has made it possible. In fact, I don't know where the verse is, maybe somebody does and you can say where it is we should look at it. I just thought of the verse that says, and we should pray, those that are opposed to themselves, we should pray for them, perhaps, God will grant them faith. Who knows that verse? Perhaps. It says, so who's saying that? That must be, that sounds like Paul to me. Uh, those that oppose themselves, something about those that are opposed, he's witness to them. And he, they're opposing themselves, meaning they don't even know what they speak of. They're not even, they're not even coherent according to the truth. Yet we should be patient with them and pray for them that perhaps God would grant them repentance or faith. I might be misquoting that, but I, I believe that the idea is correct that I'm saying. Anybody find that verse? Yeah, 2 Timothy 2 25. 2 Timothy 2 25, thank you. I've been known to misquote, seriously misquote things. 2 Timothy 2 5. 2 25. Thank you. I want to read it. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that even our faith has been granted to us. We don't stir up our faith. While you were yet dead in trespasses and sins, 
Louis lying here dead. I say, Louis, two jumping jacks. What's Louis do? Nothing. Why? No life. Louis, have faith. Push. Dead. While we were yet dead in trespass sins, Christ died for us. While we were yet dead, he forgave us our sins. So we have been granted faith, if we have faith, by the mercy and goodness of God. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. What a good God. What a good God. Mercy. Great word. Undeserved kindness is mercy. You deserve to get a kick in the rear end, and he gives you a filet mignon and lobster. Unbelievable. Two Timothy something twenty five. What was it? Two Timothy two. Two, yeah. two Timothy two twenty five. Yeah. Oh, see, I was missing the whole in meekness part. Well, let's go up further. Ah. Uh. Boy. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll start at uh, 23 here. No, 21. If a man therefore perch himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctification, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So we're to purge ourselves from uh, everything that's sinful, really. And we're to become a house of gold and silver, not wood and hay and stubble. We're to be more and more storing up treasures in heaven and not on the earth, where moth and rust will corrupt and thieves will break in and steal. So we're to be sowing to the spirit, not to the flesh. Walk by the spirit, and thou shalt not carry out the desires of the flesh. If you begin in the spirit, we should walk in the spirit. Have you begun in the spirit, and now are going to complete it in the flesh? And I think God was telling us there that we begin by the hearing of faith. That's how the spirit came to us. And we walk by the hearing of faith, as God is in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's not by rules and regulations, by our taking up and we're going to be good soldiers for Christ and we're going to be strong in our own power and might and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. That's of the flesh. That's all of the flesh. Walking in the spirit is humble and meekness, looking unto God. So, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And everybody that doesn't know the truth opposes themselves. They're leading themselves to their own destruction by not believing God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible without faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Faith is a gift, and it's a gift by God. 
and our faith, if we have the faith of a mustard seed, receives that gift from God, which is our faith, our salvation, our sanctification, our redemption, our inheritance, our gifts, our life in Christ, everything. It's a gift from God to us through his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. If you don't believe, you don't get the gift. Believing is very important. Remember, the Israelites went through the wilderness. God delivered them out of Egypt. Slay, he slew their uh, I was trying to think of a word not their employer but he was reigning over them and uh, ruling over them and uh, reigning over them in a sense and God not only delivered them but destroyed Pharaoh and all his army in the same act and then gave them water out of the rock, fed them manna, their clothes didn't wear out, fire by night and the cloud by day, miracle upon miracle, yet most perished for unbelief. And you know, most people in this world and most people I interact with that don't believe say, show me and I will believe. And I believe God says, no, you believe and I'll show you. But even that belief is a gift. So we should pray and be faithful for our loved ones, our family, our friends, acquaintances, people we meet. That We don't meet people I don't believe by chance. I think God arranges all these things. You bump into somebody at the store and you have an opportunity. And uh, I found a good opportunity in this. You go in the store and you go, ha choo! And about three or four say, God bless you. And I say, he has. And you know how he has? And then I give a little, you know, for God so loved the world. Okay. okay. So, flee youthful lust. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. Then they call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strife. And the servants of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure, if God peradventure, Give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. To the acknowledgement of the truth. And what is the truth? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes unto the Father except by me. No man comes unto me except the Father draw him. That's the truth. There's one source of life, and that's God. God the Father and God the Son said, as the Father has life in himself, he has given me life in myself that I might give you eternal life. And I give you life and it more abundantly. And they that may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil... There's the condition of those that oppose themselves. They're under the snare of the devil. And who is under the snare of the devil? Everybody that is born. Because everybody is born dead in trespass sins. Except, I have to, I think that's not a true statement. Because John the Baptist, he seemed to have been born again in the womb of Elizabeth. And uh, Jesus was without sin. Uh, so there might have been some others in some way that were not born dead in trespass sins. But for the majority, 99.9% .9 of the population are born dead in trespass sins because we're born of man, not of God. That was the great fall in the beginning. 
it says we were created in the image of God. Well, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. But all those after they fell, except for a few exceptions, they were born in the image of man. And man at that point is under the empowerment of Satan. Man gave up his authority to Satan to rule over him. So here it's telling us, and they were being patient and praying for them that they may come to repentance and acknowledge the truth and the truth being Jesus Christ and God the Father and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have, are taken captive by him at his will. It's the devil's will that holds mankind. Uh, and there's a passage that talks about even today those that are under the law and living by the law and not by grace, that there's a veil over their eyes. And that veil is of Satan. And only when they come to Christ is that veil renew, re, removed because Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law for us. We don't live under the law. We obey the law, but our salvation is not in the law. Uh, Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all those that believe. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. He is our salvation. Is that clock not working? Or I, usually the first time I look up, it's 15 minutes after. I was supposed to finish, and we started late, late, late. It's ahead by 15 seconds. And look at we still got so much more time. Keep going, brother. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I might have to say, yeah. I might start have to say it at this point, thus saith Bill Thornton. And then you got to just say, oh, geez. Let me out of here, okay? So, thank you for looking that passage up for us because uh, there was a lot more there than was in my mind when I made reference to that. That uh, about the repentance and that he perchance may grant uh, per adventure he will give them Repentance. Okay. Let's go to Matthew uh, twenty-eight. Matthew twenty-eight. Mike, I'll control this operation. Okay. Thanks for your assistance. So. Matthew 28. Well, mm. oh, I know what I want to do. Okay, Matthew 28. And let's see. Let's start with uh, 11. Oh, let's start below that. Let's go at... Uh, Verse 4. Now let's start at verse 1. Chapter 28. In the end of the Sabbath, 
as the beginning, the dawn towards the first day, and that should be the first of the Sabbath, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring the, his disciples word. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said unto them, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. Interesting, it's, he appears to the women first. And it was the women that were at the tomb first, too. And I believe what God is teaching us there, it's about relationship. It's not about authority or position or whatever. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, I'm forgetting. But when we pray, it doesn't require us to come here on Sundays to pray so that we could pray or worship God. I believe it's about relationship in our heart. And when we're praying, it's not a formula or say certain words or the right things. It's talking to God in our heart and hearing from him as we look at his word or he brings his word to mind. It's uh, responding to that. So, uh, Likewise, our worship of him is in our heart. It doesn't require us to gather together. It, we can worship him in our heart daily and should. All day, every day, we should be worshiping. We should be walking in joy and uh, love of God. So he said, all hail, and they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when there were assembled, the elders had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night, stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money, did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That word power is also authority. All power and authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. And you know, there's a heaven of heavens where God is reigning. I believe that God allows the demons and Satan to reign on this earth, which is in some way a little above this earth, because we are material and physical here along with spiritual, but they're just spirits. And so I think that's, but Jesus is claiming here all authority, that's from heaven to earth and everything in between, all authority has been given unto him. And that's very important for us because everything we are and have is all dependent upon him. And so that's good for us that all authority and power is given unto him. Go therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I am with you always. I have to question, do we believe that? I have to question, do we believe that? You know, he's telling us here, does he lie? No, he doesn't. He speaks the truth. I am with you always. If you're a believer, he is with you always. In your worst circumstance, he is with you. In your worst sin, he is with you. In your worst blessing, he is with you. All circumstance, he is always with you. And that's even till the end of the world. Amen. Amen to that. Now, he is always with us. I want to read a section out of a book I brought. This was called Born for Battle. Born for Battle. And uh, this is an account of a soldier of the cross. I thought I had marked it. Boy, oh boy. Maybe it disappeared, or maybe I'm not supposed to be reading this. No, I think it's here. Okay. I had something over here a little bit. Let's see. Uh, talking about wrestling... Uh, when Paul writes about a Christian wrestling, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and high places. He is out to make an emphasis by contrast between the riots and persecution stirred up in the natural realm by human puppets dominated and directed by evil powers of darkness and the supernatural conflict which the host of wicked spirits... So those we see rioting outside and creating havoc and everything, those are motivated mostly by evil spirits that are stirring them up to cause chaos and do whatever they're doing. But the wrestling we're dealing with is a spiritual warfare, not an earthly warfare. It's a heavenly warfare. In 2 Corinthians 1.8, he refers to a literal, actual flesh and blood situation, which he identifies as our trouble which came upon us in Asia. This was Paul referencing one of his experiences in Asia. It is quite possible that he is referring to the train of events that are recorded in Acts 19. I like to think that the things which were the ingredients of what Paul calls our trouble helped him to learn the secret of what he teaches as our wrestling. The business of war is learned in war. You learn how to walk by beginning to walk when you're little. You fall down, you fail, but with encouragement you get back up. Spiritual warfare is something we learn as we engage in it. And the main offensive issue of spiritual warfare is prayer. And I dare to venture that's probably one of the weakest areas of all of our lives. I know of mine, that's one of the weakest areas, I believe, prayer. And one of the most important. When we're praying, we're asking God to take action. We're saying, hey... I don't know what to do, or I don't understand, or can you bless this person, or would you do that? And uh, there's nothing more mighty than asking our Father, if you being sinful men know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father gives the Holy Spirit to them that ask? How much more? Your heavenly Father. How much more faithfully he will. Time again, time again, time again. The business of war is learned in war. 
in actual combat situations, not from theories expounded or drills grounded exercises. We should be aware of activities that do not bring us to grips with the enemy. Everywhere Paul went, his activities stirred up the enemy and brought him into action like a roaring lion. Satan goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And who is he able to devour? Those that are in unbelief. Who can he not devour? Those that trust and call upon God. Now, even though he devours the unbeliever, God is able to save those that are being devoured out of his kingdom. We were in the kingdom of darkness and have been translated out of the kingdom of evil, out of the kingdom of dark, into the kingdom of his dear son. So we were slaves of Satan at that point, and God rescued us. He redeemed us. He bought us with a price, his own life. So it's not hopeless when we see unbelievers. We patiently pray for them. Perchance, God might grant them repentance and belief. Okay, I'm jumping. I'm going to skip three pages for your sake. Being the kind fella I am. I pick up here. The true order of faith is not that we have to live an earthly life with a view to heaven. This is the true order of faith. Not that we live an earthly life with a view to heaven, always looking up, but that we are called to a heavenly life with a view to earth. We've already been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We are at the right hand of God in Christ Jesus. We are united to Christ Jesus. Where is Christ Jesus? At the right hand of God the Father. How come Jesus is already victorious? Because he's already resurrected at the right hand of the Father. The war is over. He's victorious. It's just being carried out. Where are we? We are in Christ Jesus. He is our life. We should walk in this world like we are coming down from heaven every second for the benefit of others and sharing our heavenly life with them. That's our position. That's a position of victory. If we think we're from the earth and we got to fight Satan from down here, he kicks us in the rear end every time. Give me a break. But we're not. We're in heaven. We're in Christ Jesus. He's the head. We're the body. We're united. Un big, big, big truth. One of the gifts of the many, many, many gifts of God. We're united to Christ. He's the vine. We're the branches. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. What? Going to have tribulation? What do you mean, be of good cheer? Give me a break. What are you, being sarcastic? No. Be of good cheer. Why? For I've overcome the world. You will have tribulation. Not you might. Maybe it's coming. Or you may. No, you will. You're going to have tribulation. Most, or a lot of it, brought on by yourself. It's my experience. But, Whatever the tribulation is, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. He overcame us. He overcame the world. He's victorious. I come to give you life and it more abundantly. I give you my joy, not as the world giveth, giveth I to you. I give you my joy. Jesus Christ went to the cross for the joy set before him, enduring the cross. Even in that. And did you, I was just the other day thinking, remember Jesus went into the uh, Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. And there he sweat great drops of blood. 
there was the trial going on, preparation, I believe, for the actual experience of the cross. Jesus was being prepared by the Holy Spirit and by himself and God the Father. He, he was sweating great. He was experiencing there what must come. And he came out of that with what? Thy will be done, not my will. Is it possible that this cup can pass? Is there some other way? Thy will be done, not my will. Could we have such a heart? Can we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ that we would dare say, thy will be done? And the funny thing is, thy will be done is the greatest thing there could be. We couldn't wish anything better, whatever it is, because God is good. I'll close with that passage from Romans 8. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave his life for us. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 28, my wife tells me. Romans 8. Okay, thank you, Michael. Let's start with... Uh, let's start with... Uh, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We must be born again, and only God can make us born again. Beseech him if you have any concern about that, that he would make you born again. He alone can make you born again. And is more than willing that we being sinful men give our children presence happily. He will grant the Holy Spirit to those that ask. Pray for your loved ones and friends and acquaintances. That they will have, uh, God will give them the desire to ask to be born again. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwell in you. So that is, not only are we, we're now we're born again in spirit already, right now, and are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, but we will receive a new resurrected body to go along with that new resurrected spirit. So we will be body and soul and spirit in heaven for eternity. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And my last message, I mentioned that, that I was thinking about Abraham called the friend of God. I was thinking, man, how cool is that? You're the friend of God. But then God reminded me, boy, you're my child. That's greater than being a friend. That's being a friend and a relationship. You can have a friend, and the friend goes, and you go, and you never see him, but you have a child, usually you have that child through your whole life. So, we have been received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have been adopted unto another gift, of the many gifts God gives us in his son, Jesus Christ. And all the gifts of God in him are yea and amen. 
He says all the gifts because I don't think we can name all the gifts. He just covers them all. There's zillion billion, I'm sure. We don't know how many times God intervenes in our lives, protecting, providing, guiding, leading. We don't have a clue. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God. Another blessing in Jesus Christ, an heir. Oh, and what's he on? What's he got? The new heavens and the new earth and everything in it. Co-heirs with Christ. From strangers in this world not having any hope to co-heirs with Christ because of but God. But God in his mercy. From strangers without hope to being a co-heir with Christ. But God, because God. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and of children then heirs, heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. So this earth that is broken and fallen and corrupted will be renewed and be glorified and be a glorified existence. God cursed the earth because of the sin of man, but he blesses the earth because he's glorifying man and making a new residence and place for him. For we know that the whole creation groaneth, travaileth, and pain together until now. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit, even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, that the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we have patience and wait for it. Our hope is Jesus Christ. He has already entered into the veil. We don't see him physically, but we know he is, and we hope in him. And when he comes again, we'll see him as he is, because we will be like him. So, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I want to mention this point. Don't not pray because you can't think of anything to pray about or for. You ought to have a time of prayer simply to worship God. And we don't even know what to pray for as we ought, but God can bring it to mind and put it in our heart what to pray for. So take the time to be available to do that in relationship to him. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he fore did foreknow, he also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what he's doing now. He's conforming us to the image of his Son. How? By presenting your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. It was purchased with a price. We're not our own. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he called. Whom he called, them he justified. Whom he justified, 
them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And we know the answer, no one, nothing. Even ourselves can't be against us, let alone Satan and principalities and powers. Can't, because God is for us. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He already gave the most precious thing available, his son, for us. He will not withhold anything. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Not only are we to pray for others, Christ makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness, peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors because Jesus Christ has got the victory already won. We conquer because he is the conqueror and we are in him. We are more than conquerors. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We in him were secured. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Father, we read these words, and you know our hearts, Father. We're so weak. Our minds are so frail. We, we don't understand, and often we don't even believe. We think we do. We say we do. But we don't act like we do, and we know that action speaks so loud you can't hear what we're saying. So, Father, we beseech you and we thank you. You are so patient and so merciful, so kind. May we take the attitude, we are but children, babies. All we know is to look to you. We don't know how to do anything. Let us just look to you, guide us, strengthen us. Let us be strong in your might, in the power of your might. Oh, Father, thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.